to the 23rd study at the British Columbian Camp 1983 and this is 2.30 on Wednesday afternoon. We'll move right back now to the study of the second temptation. We've read this in our Bibles this morning and we're just about to start on our time right now so we'll go back to it again and see the principles involved in the second victory when Christ... Um, Met the, met the devil in his own terms and conquered him for the second time. The page is 124 in Desire of Ages. We read the paragraph which tells us that Satan now supposes that he has met Jesus on his own ground, that uh, Satan pretends he has been testing the faithfulness of Jesus Christ which he now highly commends, and uh, calls upon the Saviour now to give a still further evidence of his faith in the God of heaven by casting himself down upon the, or from the temple top to demonstrate his trust in the promises of God. Now this, this um, statement that uh, the, the devil credit is back in the 91st Psalm. Let's go back to Psalms 91. This, of course, is the great psalm that um, the people of God need to memorize because there's a special one written to cover the experience of the great day of trouble which is soon to burst upon an unsuspecting world. And the text itself, you'll find, is down in verse uh, 10 and 11, or verse 11 and 12, rather. 91 verse 11 and 12. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Now you'll notice that um, in this particular statement by Satan there's something missing that is found in the verse in Psalms 91. What is that critical little phrase which is missing? Thy ways. Right, to keep thee in all thy ways. Satan quoted the verse as follows, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. And he failed to quote the second clause, which says, To keep thee in all thy ways. Now, literally, the, the um, nature of this temptation, of course, is the nature of presumption. Because... There is no provision made in this particular promise made by God back in Psalms 91 for a person to willfully and deliberately and testingly cast himself down in order to prove that the promise was true. Now Christians do not prove the promises by presumptuously putting God in a position where he's forced to save them from their own deliberate action. Let's read a little bit further now from Desire of Ages to confirm this point. Page 125. Perhaps I should read on page 124 first of all. But again the temptation, this is page 124 now, but again the temptation is prefaced with the insinuation of distrust. If thou be the Son of God, Christ was prompted to answer the if, or tempted to answer the if, but he refrained from the slightest acceptance of the doubt. He would not imperil his life in order to give evidence to Satan. The tempter thought to take advantage of Christ's humanity and urge him to presumption. <coughs> But while Satan can solicit, he cannot compel the sin. He said to Jesus, cast thyself down, knowing that he could not cast him down, for God would interpose to deliver him. Nor could Satan force Jesus to cast himself down, unless Christ should consent to temptation, he could not be overcome. Not all the power of earth or hell could force him in the slightest degree to depart from the will of his Father. That last sentence, of course, is a confirmation that Jesus Christ was, in fact, a dedicated holy man because not all the power of earth or hell could force him in the slightest degree to depart from the will of his Father. Now, have we found so far in the study of Christ's life as a child, as a youth, as a man, and now as a dedicated Messiah, have we not found so far that these words are true of nothing, not the pressure of rabbis, parents, uh, brothers, Pharisees, nor now the pressure of circumstances could, could force Christ to depart in the slightest degree from his Father's will. That's the picture, isn't it? All the way through. And because of that determination to maintain that in the will of his Father, Christ knew nothing but unqualified success in his ministry. That was the secret of it. 
And likewise, of course, that's the secret of our success as we move into the final conflict of this world's history. Reading further now, <clears throat> the tempter can never compel us to do evil. He cannot control minds unless they are yielded to his control. The will must consent. Faith must let go its hold upon Christ before Satan can exercise his power over us. Now there's those two points again. The will must consent. And what does that mean, of course? That means disobedience, does it not? Faith must let go its hold upon Christ. So there is unbelief. In other words, the unholy person, the one who elects to disobey or chooses to disobey and the one who lets go his faith upon God, that is the person under Satan's control. Satan controls the unholy. God, of course, guides the holy. Now, reading the next sentence, it says, But every sinful desire we cherish affords him a foothold. Every point in which we fail of meeting the divine standard is, is an open door by which he can enter to tempt and to destroy us. And every failure or defeat on our part gives occasion for him to reproach Christ. When Satan quoted the promise, he should give his angels charge concerning or charge over thee, he omitted the words to keep thee in all thy ways. That is, in, that is, in all the ways of God's choosing. Jesus refused to go outside the path of obedience. While manifesting perfect trust in his Father, he would not place himself unbidden in a position that would necessitate the interposition of his Father to save him from death. He would not force providence to come to his rescue and thus fail of giving man an example of trust and submission. And so he said to Satan, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. These words were spoken by Moses to the children of Israel when they thirsted in the desert and demanded that Moses should give him water or give them water, exclaiming, Is the Lord amongst us or not? God had wrought marvelously for them, yet in trouble they doubted him and demanded evidence that he was with them. In their unbelief they sought to put him to the test. And Satan was urging Christ to do the same thing. God had already testified that Jesus was his son and now to ask for proof that he was the son of God would be putting God's word to the test, tempting him. And the same would be true of asking for that which God had not promised. It would manifest, under, it would manifest distrust and be really proving or tempting him. We should not present our petitions to God to prove whether he will fulfill his word but because he will fulfill it, not, because, not to prove that he loves us but because he loves us. Without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. Now let's go back there over these points to clarify them in our minds, remembering of course that we do not present our petitions to God to prove whether he will fulfill his word, but because he will fulfill it, not to prove that he loves us, but because he loves us. When Jesus Christ was due to come to this earth, the Jewish nation, as I said before, had made all kinds of plans for God to carry out, God in the person of Jesus Christ. And their faith in him depended upon his doing what they demanded of him. Now what difference was there between that action upon the Jews, generally speaking, and Satan's call to Christ to cast yourself down to prove that God will keep his promise? What difference was there? No difference at all. So therefore, the relation of the Jewish nation to Christ's ministry upon this earth was a presumptuous relationship. They presumed that Christ would do as they called upon him to do and that in turn he, he would thereby prove to them that he was in fact the Messiah. And their faith in him depended upon his doing what they wanted him to do, which of course, as we said here, is presumption. And if we go back to Psalms 91 again, and let's read the verses which are the context to the verse that Satan misquoted. Searching as we do for any orders on God's part to cast oneself down from temple tops or mountain tops to prove these promises true, we'll find there's no such order given in this psalm whatsoever. We we'll start with verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him will I trust. 
Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Now what is a fowler? A person who catches birds. And what's a snare? A kind of a, a trap or a net. It's a net or a trap. It's a trap of some sort. Usually contains um, a, a kind of a net arrangement that is designed to entangle the birds. Okay. Now, do we find that uh, that uh, we are to make the snare or does the enemy make the snare? The enemy. What the enemy does and the promise is to deliver us from what the enemy does. In verse 4, He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by day nor for the arrow which flieth by day. The terror by night rather. Nor for the arrow which flieth by day nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasted at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Now each of these verses is talking about protection from a danger or a peril which is brought against us by an enemy. It is not, there's nowhere here is the slightest indication that we are to make a time of trouble for ourselves in order to prove that God will keep the promise and get us out of that time of trouble. We are not, in other words, to cast ourselves down from temple tops and then demand that the Lord save us. And so it goes on until we come down to verse 10. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. And in that context we read the words, For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. They shall tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shall thou trample underfoot. It will be worth our while to um, note the warning given to us in the same book, Desire of Ages, page 369. Page 369. And this is the kind of situation in which that promise is valid. And when we are brought into straight places, we are to depend upon God. We are to exercise wisdom and judgment in every action of life, that we may not by reckless movements place ourselves in trial. We are not to plunge into difficulties, neglecting the means God has provided and misusing the faculties he has given us. Christ's workers are to obey his instructions implicitly. The work is God's, and if we would bless others, his plans must be followed. Self cannot be made a center. Self can receive no honor. If we plan according to our own ideas, the Lord will leave us to our own mistakes. But when, after following his directions, we are brought into straight places, he will deliver us. We are not to give up in discouragement, but in every emergency we are to seek help from him who has infinite resources at his command. Often we shall be surrounded with trying circumstances and then in the fullest confidence we must depend upon God. He will keep every soul who is brought into perplexity through trying to keep the way of the Lord. Now you will notice in very clear terms that if we plan according to our own ideas the Lord will leave us to our own mistakes. Right? In other words, you can't expect God to save you when you deliberately put yourself in the way of temptation, when you don't practice the principles of divine order, when you go in your own self-willed direction, then you can rely upon trouble coming and you'll be left to suffer your trouble until you repent of it and call upon God to save you. Now, there are, of course, on page 126 some good counsels in regard to faith versus presumption, but in short, presumption is when we do something or when we expect to do the God to do something which he's never promised that's the simple uh, explanation of presumption and when for instance modern theology which of course is only a modern version of ancient evil theology expects God to bring apples in a thorn bush or love out of a heart full of hatred or to save a person who is unjustified then what is that that's that's presumption because, because they expect God to do what he's never promised to do. Let's move on now to the third temptation, which begins on page 129. <clears throat> and this is a very interesting temptation. 
I've uh, tended to think it wasn't really a temptation at all in my younger days, but obviously it must have been a very powerful one, otherwise Satan would never have brought this to bear upon Jesus. Page 129, we'll read it first of all, Matthew the fourth chapter, to get the scripture um, reading first, Matthew chapter 4, and start with verse 8 down to verse 11. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And said unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou they, they shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. Once again, no doubt, well, once again those angels, of course, had been held back from coming for a long, long time, and they waited until Christ had endured the test and gained the victory, and then under God's commands or orders they finally came to bring relief and deliverance to Christ. Uh, I, just read that, I just read that you one two nine one two nine one two nine now we turn to page one two nine in the book Desire of Ages to um, pick up the comment here on Matthew chapter four placing Jesus upon a high mountain. Satan caused the kingdoms of the world in all their glory to pass in panoramic view before him. The sunlight lay on temple cities, marble palaces, fertile fields and fruit laden vineyards. The traces of evil were hidden. The eyes of Jesus so lately greeted by gloom and desolation now gazed upon a scene of unsurpassed loveliness and prosperity. Then the tempter's voice was heard, All this power will I give you and the glory of them for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will I give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. Now Satan is offering Jesus Christ a supposed shortcut to a completed work. He is offering Christ a, a way of um, completion for his ministry without the suffering and agony which was to attend the real way of deliverance from the power of Satan and sin. But the facts were, of course, that Satan could not really give all this to Christ anyhow. That was impossible. He didn't really own it. It is true, of course, that he had become the prince of this world. But remember this, that Adam back in the Garden of Eden was, was a king of the earth, but not an independent king. He was a vicegerent of God. He was one who held this as a vassal, as um, a subordinate king. And when Satan overcame Adam, he didn't overcome Jesus Christ and therefore did not get the ultimate ownership of this world. And Christ had come down to this earth to win this world back and return it to the sons of men once more. Now, Jesus knew with great clarity that he could not gain the victory excepting it be through suffering, as the next paragraph says. Christ's mission could be fulfilled only through suffering. Before him was a life of sorrow, hardship and conflict and ignominious death. He must bear the sins of the whole world. He must endure separation from his father's love. Now the tempter offered to yield up the power he had usurped. Christ might deliver himself from the dreadful future by acknowledging the supremacy of Satan, but to do this was to yield the victory in the great controversy. It was in seeking to exalt himself above the Son of God that Satan had sinned in heaven. Should he prevail now, it would be the triumph of rebellion. <clears throat> now once again, as I said before, the simple, the simple solution for Christ in this situation was to ask himself the question, what are my orders? And what were his orders? To bow before Satan? Never. Never, never, never was he to do that. His orders were to build the kingdom according to certain very, very specific principles. Now, the kingdoms of this world upon which Christ now gazed and which, which seem to um, portray or reveal such prosperity, such ease of living, such wealth, such power, had all been built by the use of certain principles which were totally contrary to the will and purpose of God. And as Christ gazed upon all that power and majesty, 
and as Christ with very very clear penetration realized how those kingdoms had been built and therefore how they must be maintained knew he could not be a part of that system just no way in the world could he be a part of that system now for instance <clears throat> if we go back to the days of King Nebuchadnezzar one probably not exactly the first great world empire there was Egypt and Assyria at least before that time and other great nations as well but certainly the first one listed in the book of Daniel uh, of the first of the four great world empires from Babylon through to Rome how did Nebuchadnezzar build that great world a kingdom by the principles of righteousness or the principles of force by the principles of force right and um by the same principles that kingdom perished because as Jesus himself said later those who live by the sword shall die. perish or die by the sword and by the very same procedures that Babylon had been built Babylon was destroyed now Medo-Persia came along and learned absolutely nothing from the history of Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon because Medo-Persia then set about to build another world empire exactly as Nebuchadnezzar had built his. And what was the outcome? It was the same. That kingdom also passed away. Now Greece came on the scene and the Greeks who, who, who prided themselves on their wisdom, on their philosophy and so forth, on their knowledge of history and of the sciences and whatnot, they ought to have said now, all right, Babylon and Medo-Persia have come and gone before us. Babylon was built in a certain fashion, be the Persia the same way. Babylon perished in a, in a certain fashion, be the Persia the same way. Is there a connection between the way in which Babylon rose to power and the way in which she died? Did they ask those questions? No. They didn't ask those questions. They learned nothing from the rise and fall of those previous empires. And they then went about building their king in the same way and suffered the same fate as also did the Romans and every other world power since that point of time excepting for those who have not existed long enough yet to reap the full results of their method of kingdom building. Now Jesus Christ came to this earth to build a kingdom in a very, very, on a very, very different basis according to a, diff a different structural proposition. As we read on page 333 of this same book, Desire of Ages, that through the parables, the mustard seed and so forth, Jesus Christ showed both the manner of... The the manner of his kingdom and the way in which it would be built and established. Now Christ recognised, no doubt, when Satan offered him this, this temptation, that what, what Satan was offering to him was something which had in itself the seeds of its own destruction. So while we're good at the moment, that moment must pass, and what would the end time bring? Self-destruction to all these glorious kingdoms. And... Um, he therefore uh, recognised that the way that he had been sent to build the kingdom was the only way which would bring a, a permanent and eternal kingdom of light and glory. I'd like to note from the little book Christ Object Lessons a statement here on the parable of the mustard seed which parable tells that um, God's way of kingdom building was very different from that which the world uh, reverences page 7, 6 and page 7, 7 we know the parable very well to what shall we like in the kingdom of heaven Jesus said it's like a mustard seed which is the smallest of seeds and yet goes to be the biggest of all the herb trees let's read now a few thoughts from Christ Object Lessons page 7, 6 and 7, 7 in the multitude who listened to Christ's teaching there were many Pharisees these noted contemptuously how few of his hearers acknowledged him as the Messiah and they questioned with themselves how this unpretending teacher could exalt Israel to universal dominion without riches, power or honour how was he to establish the new kingdom Christ read their thoughts and answered them where unto shall we liken the kingdom of God or with what comparison shall we compare it in earthly governments there was nothing that could serve as a similitude. No civil society could afford him a symbol. It is like a grain of mustard seed, he said, which, when it is sown upon the earth, there will be less than all the seeds that are upon the earth, yet when it is grown, when it is sown, groweth up and becometh greater than all the herbs, and putteth out great branches, so that the birds of the heaven can lodge under the shadow thereof. 
and that comes from Matthew chapter 13 of course 31 and 32 the germ in the seed goes by the unfolding of the life principle which God, God has implanted its development depends upon no human power so it is with the kingdom of Christ it is a new creation its principles of development are the opposite of those that rule the kingdoms of this world earthly governments prevail by physical force they maintain the dominion by, by war but the founder of the new kingdom is the prince of peace the Holy Spirit represents worldly kingdoms under the symbols of fierce beasts of prey but Christ is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world in his plan of government there is no employment of brute force to compel the conscience the Jews look for the kingdom of God to be established in the same way as the kingdoms of the world. To promote righteousness, they resorted to external measures, they devised methods and plans, but Christ implants a principle. By implanting truth and righteousness, he counterworks error and sin. Now, we read yesterday that John the Baptist discovered that his own spirit of self-abnegation was the spirit of Jesus Christ and the kingdom which he come to establish now when you find that the spirit within you harmonizes with the spirit in somebody else then what do you find between yourself and that person you find fellowship don't you but when you find that the system of church government or the system of state government or, or national government and the, and the principle that system has in it a different spirit from what you've got then how can you be a part of that of that system it's impossible it's quite impossible and you know today if you want to be president of the United States of America or Prime Minister of Australia or the Chancellor of Germany or the dictator of Russia then you've got to have in you certain qualities that no Christian ever wants to see in himself you've got to be ruthless you've got to be despotic you've got to be domineering you've got to have very little care for the uh, feelings and interests of others everything is, is uh, devoted to establishing that kind of system with its attendant spirit and so forth and therefore when Satan asked Christ to bow down before him in order to accept the kingdoms of this world Satan was asking him to have in himself or to accept in himself a very different spirit altogether from what he already had a totally opposite and contrary spirit in other words the spirit of rebellion and the spirit of disobedience the spirit of disloyalty to God and distrust of God. So it's a very, very, a very, very wide and far-reaching demand which Satan was making of Jesus Christ that day. Now, of course, most certainly when Satan showed Christ these these uh, cities and kingdoms and all their beauty and prosperity, he was hiding the evil spirit in them for the time being at least, so Christ would not discern what he was really getting into and that's Satan's device of course every time he doesn't make plain to us what we're getting into he makes us think we're getting into the very best of things when in fact of course we're going into the very worst of things now for instance supposing someone today was to offer you the presidency of well the United States of America or the prime ministership in here in Canada or Australia the chancellorship of Germany what would be your first reaction? Would you jump at the idea? I certainly wouldn't because I, I just couldn't think of myself being involved in that system and having to do what those men have to do in order to, to preserve their position and um, maintain the kingdom which they have been called upon to rule or to, or to govern. And so therefore, the issues in this third temptation are very, very deep and far-reaching and... Um, Christ was tempted but he once again met the temptation with the plain thus saith the, Lord, thus saith the word of God he said to Satan thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve now this temptation if you think about it was the same that was offered to Eve back in the garden of Eden Satan came to her there and said to her now look uh, I got something far better for you than that which you personally have all you have to do is to reach out and pluck the fruit of this tree and it will magically exalt you to a level with God himself now Eve should have simply said to herself let that be as it may the facts are no matter what advantage I may gain by partaking of this tree the fact is God has said thou shalt not eat of it 
Now she'd asked the question, what are my orders? On the one hand, what are the promises upon the other? And she said to Satan, look, I know my orders, I'm going to obey my orders, which you've fallen. No. Impossible. So again and again you find that that question is our safeguard, isn't it? Obedience is righteousness, and righteousness, of course, is the safeguard against the power of the tempter. <clears throat> Let's turn now to page 113 and we will find some thoughts which support this principle very clearly. When the tempter offered to Christ the kingdom and glory of the world, he was proposing that Christ should yield up the real kingship of the world and hold dominion subject to Satan. This was the same dominion upon which the hopes of the Jews were set. They desired the kingdom of this world. If Christ had consented to offer them such a kingdom, they would gladly have received him, but the curse of sin would always wear rested upon it. Christ declared to the tempter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. At that day Christ made a choice between two different kinds of kingdom. The kingdom built upon one principle versus that built upon the other principle. And Sister Wise says here the Jews made the same choice. And this choice was made by them most... Um, emphatically when Caiaphas stood before the Sanhedrin council and said to, the, said to the members of that council it is better that one man should perish than, than that the whole nation should perish remember those words? Yes. right now what was Caiaphas really saying? he was saying that if Christ goes on establishing his kingdom his way it means that the, that the kingdom of Israel as it now is must pass away which, which of course was entirely true and so he said it is better than to destroy Christ and his kingdom for what purpose? That, that Israel as it now is may remain and that day of course Caiaphas and the leading members of the Sanhedrin made their choice for Satan's kingdom while they totally and completely rejected Christ's kingdom whereas Christ on the mountaintop made the exact opposite choice from that made by Caiaphas and those men later now read further by the one this is page 130 by the one who had revolted in heaven the kingdoms of this world were offered Christ to buy his homage to the principles of evil but he would not be bought he had come to establish a kingdom of righteousness and he would not abandon his purpose with the same temptation Satan approaches men and here he has better success than with Christ to many offers the kingdoms of this world on condition that they will acknowledge his supremacy he requires that they sacrifice integrity disregard conscience indulge selfishness Christ bids them seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness but Satan walks by their side and says whatever may be true in regard to life eternal in order to make a success in this world you must serve me I hold your welfare in my hands I can give you riches pleasures honour and happiness Hearken to my counsel. Do not allow yourself to be carried away with whimsical notions of honesty or self-sacrifice. I will prepare the way before you. Thus multitudes are deceived. They consent to live for the service of self and Satan is satisfied. While he allures them with the hope of worldly dominion, he gains dominion over the soul. But he offers that which is not his to bestow and which is soon to be wrested from him. In return he beguiles them of their title to the inheritance of the sons of God. Now, a very, very common device on Satan's part, and I've seen this work again and again and again, is when folk get an interest in this message, and they're back there, particularly in the Seventh day Adventist Church, from which, of course, most folk come to this movement, and uh, when the church perceives that they're gaining interest in the message, they promptly give to them a, a very significant and important position in the church. They suddenly become elder for the first time or they become a Sabbath school teacher or a secretary or something of this nature and that's all it takes for those folks to forget all about the message uh, completely and forever and in the last days of this, of this great controversy when the loud cry goes forth Satan will still use this kind of, of trickery and I'll read this to you on page 607 in the book Great Controversy and uh, this talks about the advancing work of the loud crying page 607 great controversy 
as the controversy extends to the new fields and the minds of the people are called to God's downtrodden law, Satan is astir. The power attending the message will only madden those who oppose it. The clergy will put forth almost superhuman efforts to shadow away the light, lest it should shine upon their flocks. By every means at their command, they will endeavour to suppress the discussion of these vital questions. The Church appeals to the strong arm of civil power, and in this work, Papists and Protestants unite. As the movement for Sunday enforcement becomes more bold and decided, the law will be invoked against commandment keepers, they'll be threatened with fines and imprisonment, and here it comes now, and some will be offered positions of influence and other rewards and advantages as inducements to announce their faith. But the steadfast answer is, show us from the word of God our error, the same plea made by Luther under similar circumstances. Now some will be persecuted, but others will be offered positions of power and influence to induce them to give up their faith, and in some cases it will be successful. Now I've noticed of course in the past that uh, with uncanny precision the church seems to know which folk to persecute and which folk to offer positions of influence and, and it seems they seem to know just the ones to offer positions to and uh, in case after case after case I've seen it work all too well and folk have lost all their interest in the message in consequence of their suddenly being given these positions of responsibility in the church. Now let's just conclude this story of the second, the third temptation with um, Christ's conquest of Satan and once again the beautiful attitude of the angels to all this drama. Satan had questioned whether Jesus was the Son of God. In his summary dismissal he had proof that he could not gainsay. Divinity flashed through suffering humanity. Satan had no power to resist the command Writhing with humiliation and rage, he was forced to withdraw from the presence of the world's Redeemer. Christ's victory was as complete as had been the failure of Adam. So we may resist temptation and force Satan to depart from us. Jesus gained the victory through submission and faith in God. And by the Apostle he says to us, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Now I greatly appreciate the summing up that Sister White makes here where she says Jesus gained the victory through one, submission and two, faith in God. Now again, what is submission? Obedience. Obedience. So Christ gained the victory through total submission to God's will and through complete faith in God. And we, of course, will gain the victory in the same manner. In fact, it's the only way to gain the victory, is it not? There is no other way. And the moment that we depart from those principles, of course, we have lost our garment of holiness and we then become subject to Satan's power. So when Satan comes to us, don't ever get into an argument with him, don't ever party with him, don't even listen to his arguments, simply say to him, Satan, you and I are not on speaking terms. And if you wish to debate this matter as I can see you do, then go and debate with somebody else, namely Jesus Christ, referring to Christ. And when you do that, Satan will leave you alone every single time. Fix your mind upon the great promises of God, ask yourself what are my orders, and then through submission and faith, as you turn away from Satan's arguments, you'll find that victory will be absolutely yours. And I found that nothing works so well as telling the devil to go along and talk to Christ instead of talking to you. And you appreciate the fact, of course, that Christians do not go out to get the victory over Satan. Christians do not get the victory over Satan. Do they? No. no, because that victory has already been gained. We turn back to page 490 again in the same book, Desire of Ages. Page 419, we read these words. Beyond the cross of Calvary was agony and shame. Jesus looked forward to the great final day when the prince of the power of the air will meet his destruction on the earth so long marred by his rebellion. Jesus beheld the work of evil forever ended and the peace of God filling heaven and earth. Henceforward, Christ's followers will look upon Satan as a conquered foe, not as a foe to be conquered, right? We have to look upon him as a conquered foe. Why? Because on the cross, 
Jesus was to gain the victory for them, that victory he, he desired them to accept as his own. Behold, he said, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Christ, I give unto you power to do these things. So Christ has gained the victory and we are simply to accept that victory which is given to us. Now tell me another scripture which tells us that the victory is a gift from God. Remember? By the way, the reference for I give unto you power is Luke 10 verse 19. If you if you'd like to note that in the margins of your great controversy, uh, your desire of ages, or just remember the text itself. First Corinthians 15 verse 57 says, "But thanks be to God that giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ." Right. So victory is the gift of God, and no Christian ever goes out to get the victory over Satan. First he gets the victory, which of course is the gift of God through Jesus Christ, and then he goes out to meet the devil. So if you go out with the idea of fighting against Satan and of getting the victory over him, then of course we've lost the battle already because Satan will then uh, separate us from Jesus Christ and will most certainly gain the victory over us. But if we go out there hid in Jesus Christ knowing that the victory has been gained, we only have to live in that victorious experience, then Satan has no hope of overcoming us whatsoever. As the statement goes on to say that with him, that is with Jesus Christ, with him as the victor, and with us as his faithful servants, there can be no such thing as failure, loss, impossibility, or defeat. What was the text in Corinthians? Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 57. Now I come back to page 131, Desire of Ages. We cannot save ourselves from the tempter's power. He has conquered humanity, and when we stand or try to stand their own strength he, we shall become a prey to his devices but the name of the Lord is a strong tower the righteous runneth into it and is safe Satan trembles and flees before the weakest soul who finds refuge in that mighty name <clears throat> this now brings us to the ministry of the angels again we won't have time to cover this properly before the study period time runs out so let's close then with the thought that um, the victory has been won, the battle is over, and after all said and done, between whom is the controversy anyway? Between Christ and Satan, not between us and Satan. We, we of course, are elements in the struggle. We are uh, subjects of uh, Satan's devices and also of Christ's saving work. But the actual victory has been gained, the battle has been won, and therefore we simply accept the life of Christ unto ourselves. That life is the victory, and we go out to meet the foe on these terms. However, in order to maintain the victory gain, we have to follow the principle of, of holiness, which is sub submissive obedience and trusting faith in God's saving power, and always asking the question, what are my orders and what are the promises, and knowing these to obey the one and trust the other. The reference being for that, reference for our being page 121 in Desire of Ages right we'll leave it there then as our time is now gone are there any questions you'd like to ask yes yeah do you think that uh, Romans 1620 applies to the victory to be gained in uh, the final struggle what's the sign uh, it says the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly Yes, I guess it, I guess it would refer to that final victory, which is to be gained when we uh, when we God's instruments to um, bring bring to cut off His support and bring Him to His final end. Any other questions? Right, then it's now about twenty past um, three.